and welcome to A Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome to anyone who's found us for the first time. I'm so thankful that you're here today, friend. It is no accident that you're here, so please don't run off quite yet. Please stick around for a bit, and let's see what the Lord has for all of us today. And welcome to you regular listeners. I am so thankful for you. I love being on this journey with all of you each day, and I wish I knew who each of you were, but the Lord doesn't have it that way for now, and so we'll just keep continuing this way, but know that I pray for you frequently. I pray for you daily that the Lord would just bless you and draw you closer to Him and give you more of a desire to know Him, that you will be intentional about spending time with Him and that you will want to read and study and live and share his word. Oh, friends, we we must desire that. We must want to be in his word. His word is truth, and we need truth. His word is our spiritual nourishment, because we read that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so if we truly love him, we will want to know more of him, and the way that we do that is through his word. So I just want to encourage you in that today. Please know that I love to hear from you, so if you feel so led, send me a message sometime and let me know what the Lord is doing in your life as you're spending more time with him. And also, please consider sharing this podcast with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone who you think may receive a blessing from it. Well, our verse for the day for August the 2nd, 2024, comes from that Old Testament book of prophecy, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 2, and it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I am jealous with great jealousy for Zion, and with great wrath I am jealous for her. Oh, friends, I'm excited for us to park here and think about this. Um, You know, the world would say, well, what does that mean? Uh, What does that mean that he's jealous? Jealous is not good because we think of jealousy as a a bad trait. Um, But in the way that the Lord uses it here, it just shows the, the intensity of his love for his people. And so um, I'm excited for us to park here and think about this. Uh, But, you know, if you've been on this journey with me for very long, this is the time that I think it's wise for us to think about where we are in the Scripture first. Uh, What book or letter are we in? Who may have written it? What uh, is going on? And that helps us to get that appropriate context so we can understand more of this and also to guard against uh, those who would twist the scripture. Uh, So if they come at us with uh, something that is uh, not true, we'll be able to say, well, I know where that is, or I know roughly where it is, so let's go look it up and see what it says. Let's look, uh, go back to the truth, and don't take man's word. Go back to that standard. When everything seems fuzzy and out of whack and turned upside down and confusing, go back to what you know is true. And that is uh, God's word. And we go back to who we know is faithful. And that is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So there are going to be many times, probably several times a day, where things get a little uh, shaky at times. But always go back to what you know is true and to the one who you know is true. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I just love that. Well, we are in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament begins with the five books of the law, and then it moves to Old Testament history, and then to the wisdom and poetry literatures, as it's called, Esther, Job, Psalms, Psalm, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. Then it moves into the prophets. The Old Testament closes out with the prophets, so you've got the five, the the five books or the four major prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and Lamentations is stuck right in there with Jeremiah because he wrote that. And then the final 12 books of the Old Testament are called the Minor Prophets. The Major Prophets were called Major primarily because of their volume. They were, in general, 
larger, but uh, that's a generalization because Daniel's book of prophecy, for example, uh, is a little smaller than Hosea and Zechariah, but he is considered one of the major prophets. Um, the major, the minor prophets tended to be um, smaller in general, but uh, regardless, all of these are God's word. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. And so every bit of it is important for us. And when we think about these are God's words, they came from him to us. And um, we talked about this when we were in Hebrews or often when we're in Hebrews that the the books of prophecy is how he spoke to the uh, the forefathers. And uh, there were messages for them that were going to happen right then. And then there were uh, long-term messages that uh, affect us and will affect us. And we very much see that this major, I'm sorry, minor prophet book of Zechariah talks a lot about Jesus. It's very what we would call messianic. Doesn't mean that it's messy. It means it refers to the Messiah. Um, it also has what we call some eschatology, which is a big churchy word, which means it, it relates to some of the end times. And so uh, I love it that we are here. I love it that God so graciously gave us these. You know, we've talked about this before. I've mentioned to you that uh, I, when when I first started studying uh, more in depth, and then even some now, when we get to the books of prophecy, I get a little nervous because I I don't want to handle it in a wrong way. Of course, I don't want to handle any of God's word, anything of God in a wrong way. Um, but there are a lot of things that are uh, a little hard to understand just because of the names and the places and the people we don't always know. Uh, but we can think about and categorize these books of prophecy based on to whom they were originally given and also the relative time period. So, for instance, we've talked about uh, the minor prophet book of uh, Obadiah was given to Edom, ministered to Edom. Uh, Jonah and Nahum were to Nineveh. Amos and Hosea were primarily to that northern kingdom. All the rest of them were to, uh, in general, for the most part, to that southern kingdom of Judah. Remember, there were 12 tribes, uh, the 12 uh, sons of Israel. All their descendants were in these 12 tribes. And uh, for a while, they were united their first king, Saul, and then David, and then Solomon were all three kings over this uh, united or 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, but because of disobedience on Solomon's part and God's plan for how he would deal with that, um, that would be uh, divided. And so there was going to be, and there was a northern kingdom of Israel, which was 10 tribes and a southern kingdom of Judah. God would continue to keep his promise because he is faithful even when his people are not. And he had made a promise. He would continue to keep his promise through the line of that southern kingdom of Judah. And the ultimate promise that would come through that would be Jesus would come through that uh, southern kingdom of Judah through that lineage. And uh, so those um, most of the books of prophecy are to that southern kingdom of Judah. Two of those, Daniel and Ezekiel, were specifically to the exiles while they were in Babylon. Um, but the rest of them we can look at as pre-exilic. In other words, they came before the exiles, and that was both for the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom because that northern kingdom, part of their punishment for disobedience and um, turning away from God would be that he would send the uh, conquerors from Assyria to scatter them. Um, but that southern kingdom of Judah uh, he told them that they would be carried off to Babylon. 
And so there was a time when they, it was before the exile and then during the exile with Daniel and Ezekiel. And then there were three prophets writing to the people uh, who returned from that Babylonian exile. And remember when we were in Ezra, we talked about that. They went down, they were carried off in three waves and they were brought back in three waves. And um, so we have... Uh, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi were the prophets that God used to speak to the people after they came back from their exile. And so Zechariah is where we are today. So Zechariah was a prophet, but he was also a priest. And we can read here at the beginning of his book of prophecy in Zechariah 1.1, it says, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, saying, Yahweh was very wrathful against your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Return to me, declares Yahweh of hosts, that I may return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. And so Zechariah was given words uh, from God to tell the people, and he, uh, his name means the Lord remembers, and that is so fitting because when we look throughout Zechariah's prophecy, um, the Lord, even though he was upset uh, with Judah and the way that they had turned from God, the way that the many of the ancestors had turned away from God, he remembered, God remembered, the Lord remembered his covenant. He remembered his promise. He kept his promise, and he was going to keep his promise. And that's where some of the good news of Zechariah's prophecy comes in, when he talks about um, the Messiah and what he will do. And, it, and we hear the good news of how things are going to be better for Jerusalem and for Judah and um, that may not all happen right then in the lifetime of those who were receiving that prophecy originally, those who had just returned from Babylon and were trying to rebuild. Um, but some good things certainly happened then. But um, also it talks about the good things to come when Jesus would come to the earth and what he would do for us and then when he's coming again. And so part of this that we will end up thinking about and looking at in our verse for the day, I think really um, may apply to that time when everything is made new and everything is made right. And um, I'm just excited for us to look at that and to, to park there. We read that Jesus mentioned that this Zechariah, this Zechariah son of uh, Bechariah, uh, the son of Edo, um, was murdered in the temple. And uh, you, if you look at Matthew chapter 23, and that's what happened to many of the prophets. Um, and God would speak to them about that <laughs> at different times when he was sending messages to the people. He would talk about how um, they didn't listen, and Jesus brought that up. But listen to this. He says in um Matthew twenty three thirty four, Jesus was saying, On account of this, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered, between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus told us, tells us how this Zechariah died, and um, that often happened with those who stood for the truth. Um, all of the apostles, uh, Jesus' apostles, except for Judas Iscariot, and uh, John, the gospel writer, John, the uh, apostle, John, the revelator, all the rest of them died martyr's death. Paul died a martyr's death. Peter died a martyr's death. And um, it was because they stood for what was right. They stood boldly and uh, they did it because they knew that this was temporary. This lifetime was temporary. This um, 
life was but just a vapor, uh, but there was so much more coming. And so they were willing to stand firm and willing to stand uh, for their God and uh, for their Savior. And so that's a little bit about Zechariah's background. You see in his uh, book of prophecy a lot of visions, especially in those first few chapters. Um, And then we get over to this part of chapter 7, and we spent some time there last month right before we get to the beginning of chapter 8. And I just want you to hear um, how it flows. God had talked about to Zechariah um, and given a message for him to to remind the people, uh, reminding them about their hard hearts. And if we look in this um, chapter 7, verse 8, it says, Then the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah, saying, Thus has Yahweh of hosts said, Judge with true justice and show loving kindness and compassion each to his brother, and do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the sojourner, or the afflicted, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. But they refused to give heed, and turned a stubborn shoulder, and dulled their ears from hearing, and they made their hearts diamond hard, so that they could not hear the law and the words which Yahweh of hosts had sent by a spirit by the hand of the former prophets. Therefore great wrath came from Yahweh of hosts. And it happened that just as he called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen, says Yahweh of hosts. But I scattered them with a storm wind among all the nations whom they have not known. Thus the land is desolated behind them so that no one was passing through and returning, for they made the pleasant land desolate. And when you hear that... It sounds, oh dear, you know, there, there's not a lot of, there's no good news there. And God would have every right to just have said, all right, I'm done. I've told you, just like he would have every right to do that to us. He, he could say, I've given you uh, the word. I've told you what is right. And you still choose to uh, rebel and refuse much like they had done. But then listen to this chapter 8. I love this because remember, our unfaithfulness does not make God unfaithful. He keeps his promises. He is a faithful God. He His word stands. So if he says he's going to do something, he will do it. So listen to this at the beginning of chapter 8 leading into our verse for the day. Then the word of Yahweh of hosts came saying, so after he had Uh, talked about this and and talked about the punishment. Uh, He says, thus, in our verse for the day, thus says Yahweh of hosts, I am jealous with great jealousy for Zion, and with great wrath I am jealous for her. And I'm going to read past it. Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, And the mountain of Yahweh of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of the of age. I love that. And so we see that God was going to keep his promise. We know that God reproves, he disciplines, he chastens those that he loves. And so part of that discipline for God's people where when they had turned away from God would be that he told them that there would be those who would be sent off uh, into exile. He had given that message to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah told the people, and then it happened starting in 605 B.C. when uh, many were carried off into exile, and we've talked about that. But it was going to be in exile for 70 years, and then they were going to be able to come back to Jerusalem. And God could have just said, I'm done, but he didn't. He says, I love you so much. I am jealous with great jealousy for Zion and with great wrath, I am jealous for her. Now that might seem backwards because, you know, as I mentioned, we think about jealousy as being a, a negative connotation. But when you think about it, that God loves us so much, he loves his people so much that he will go to the lengths necessary to take care of his people, even though we don't deserve it. (laughs) 
he goes to great lengths because he he loves his creation so and he was he was jealous with great jealousy for zion zion was that holy mountain uh, there in jerusalem and with great wrath i am jealous for her in other words i think that may mean that um all those that will come against his holy ones at some point are going and his loved ones at some point are going to feel the wrath of god all those that come against him and his holy city and his children um they will feel that at at one day or another and um He tells us that good news, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth and the holy mountain of Yahweh of hosts will be called the holy mountain. That seems to be um, a time that has yet to come. And I think that's when there's the new Jerusalem, the new holy city, like we read over in Revelation. If you look at this, let me hop over there. I want you to see this. I want you to hear how John the Revelator uh, describes this based on what the Lord allowed him to see. And this is written in Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like precious stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great high wall. It had twelve gates, and at those gates twelve angels. And names have been written on those gates, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. And the city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as the width and the measured city with the rod 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal, and he measured its wall 144 cubits according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. I love that. And then he goes and talks about the different stones, and you can read that in uh, in Revelation 21. But listen to this 22 in, in ver- chapter 21, verse 22 of Revelation. It said, And I saw no sanctuary in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be closed by day, for there will be no night there. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing defiled, and and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, bright as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his slaves will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And so that is this city that I think God was talking to Zechariah about. I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. I think it's that new Jerusalem. Um, Now, certainly this Zechariah, this prophecy here was given before Jesus came. And there is no doubt that when Jesus came, that God was in Jerusalem and Jesus is the truth and he was there in the midst. Um, But we also know that there's going to be a day when everything will be uh, peaceful and as it should be, like we see in the verses after our verse for the day. Um, But God does this because he loves us so 
He will carry out his plan because he loves us with such an intense, everlasting love that he is jealous for us. And he will defeat all the men, enemies of him and the enemies of his people. And we see that in this uh, chapter 8. It just shows his might and his power and just his intense, extravagant love for us. And can we just give him the thanks and praise for that, that he loves us so, that he loves us so that he sent Jesus for us, that he loves us so that he made a way that we could be made right with him so that we won't have to endure that wrath um, that we deserve, that, but that was poured out on Jesus because of our sins. Oh, friends, we have so much to be thankful for. Give him the thanks and praise. Blessings to you until next time.